Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. And today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. It is our author, Patrick Sanahan. He is a amazing individual who focuses on topics like procrastination. Today, his discussion will be surrounded about the topic, and he has some great advice, some great tools and techniques that he'd like to share with you for everyone out there who may have um, suffer a little bit from procrastination. We all have our little bit of tippet tiblets that we could also tweak in our lives. So this is a great episode. So put your ears on and listen, because you're really going to enjoy this episode. So Patrick, tell everybody about yourself. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I'm very excited also. Um, so my name is Pat Sanahan. Uh, I have a, a small consulting firm in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, which is about 30 miles north of Philadelphia. And uh, we play mostly in the higher education arena. We help mm -hmm. uh, campuses and universities uh, plan for the future. We also help them uh, with presidential transitions, like when a new person comes on board. And we also do a fair amount of uh, board retreats and facilitation. We do a little bit of corporate work, but mostly mm -hmm. it's higher education. I would love to hear about uh, procrastination. Now, you authored a book about a year and a half ago about uh, procrastination. And as we were speaking, you know, up to 25% of our nation suffers from procrastination. And globally, I'm sure there's tons, you know, the percentages go way up. And, you know, it's a common, it's a, it's a common characteristic that a lot of people have. And I don't know if you would, would characteristic as a disorder or not, but a lot of people are procrastinators, you know, to some degree. And so I'd really love to learn more about that. And for people who suffer from it, maybe you can, you know, show us some different tools and techniques on sure. how to overcome it. Absolutely. Uh, procrastination is a, is a habit. I call it a mean habit because you pay a price for it. And right. a lot of procrastinators, um, you know, pay a price financially by late uh, credit card payments, uh, income tax returns, keep on delaying it and delaying it and the fees keep on hitting them. A lot of times going for a new job or writing a proposal, they'll put it off and put it off. And so they stay kind of static at their careers. And even the health field, a lot of people, a buddy of mine is a doctor who does colonoscopies. And about 15% of the people, the day before they're going in to get a colonoscopy, uh, cancel. They just, it gets too anxiety for them and too, too upsetting. And so they, they cancel. And this is something that could be really important for their physical health. So people delay going to the dentist. So. Procrastinators pay a price for it. And uh, I wrote the book uh, during COVID because um, I had a lot of time on my hands I'd never had before. I was on the road about 175 days a year for about 30 years. Wow. Uh, in a consulting practice. Yeah, and I'm very successful, very happy. I did good work and enjoyed my clients. But all of a sudden, COVID hit and no one was flying and we we're doing a lot of these Zoom meetings. But I had yeah. more time in my hand than I ever had before. And I looked right. around my office, which is a, a big office full of books and things. And I had three boxes of articles and journals and interviews about procrastination because it's something I've wrestled with my entire career. Right. And one of the premises of the book is you can be a productive procrastinator. I'm a very productive procrastinator. I have a doctorate. I've written 12 books. I have a great consulting uh, business. But there's still a few things that I procrastinate around. Two yes. of them one is doing my income taxes because all the <laughs> numbers and the math and the details, it just gets overwhelming for me. Right. And also invoicing clients you know when i'm on the road and i might have three clients in a three-week trip uh different fees for different clients there's air tickets there's hotel tickets there's meal tickets it just i just put it all in a box and then when i get home i kind of stare at the box for a couple of days saying geez i gotta get down to this so those are the two arenas that i still wrestle with but i've come up with about you know 10 15 smart strategies that really work to help you manage your procrastination oh that's great can you share with us some of those yes. strategies Sure. It started about 30 years ago. I was writing my dissertation, uh, uh, getting a doctorate. And what I was doing was not writing the dissertation. I was reading it. I was doing more and more research and more and more. So it, it's a very sophisticated form of procrastination. But right. at the end of the day, you got to write the dissertation. So I met with my chair and he said, Pat, you've had seven years. You've taken all your coursework, your, all your exams. But if you don't finish the dissertation this next year, you are going to have to say goodbye to you. And it was pretty scary that you put a lot of time, money, effort into getting a doctorate, and then I just hit a wall. So I was smart enough to ask my colleagues who had finished their dissertation, something really important for procrastinators to do, don't go alone, ask for advice, ask for help, because most people will give you some good advice. Yeah. And they all had these little strategies 
that help them manage their own procrastination. And these are the three that have I've used for about 30 years, and it might be helpful for your readers and listeners. And one is that it's really helpful to make your progress visible. Mm -hmm. And uh, any way you can do that that says, I just did 30 minutes of work or 15 minutes of research, or I cleaned out the garage, you know, a fourth of the garage. And if you can make it visible. So what I do, I don't know if you can see this, this is my agenda on a daily basis. It's okay. bright yellow. I have it across my wall. So my six or seven things I have to do. Now I used to have 10 and 12 things every day because procrastinators right. are oftentimes way too aspirational. I yeah. only limit it to six. And anytime I finish one of my agenda items, like talking to you, I'm going to go across. The, I score it out with a big black marker and it feels wonderful. Right. So I make my progress visible. Right. The second one is uh, chewable chunks. A lot of times people get caught into, they got to sit down and they got to paint the house, the whole house. They got to clean out the garage, which could take a two or three days, or they got to write that chapter, which would take days and days and days. Yes. And they say, no, 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 Pat, all you got to do is spend 30 minutes doing something and then take a break. Right. Really? 30 minutes and take a break, 30 minutes and take a break. Now, the thing for procrastinators to watch out for is sometimes they'll take a break using social media and then six hours later, you know, they're, yeah. they're got to do something that's a little bit more constructive. Take a walk, have a cup of tea, talk to a friend, read something nice. But take a break every 30 minutes or so. And then the last one was rewards work. And this is something I say, I really resisted. They said, Pat, we have reward. They call them reward maps. We have little maps, all the things we like to do. After we do something, we reward ourselves. And I said, and a lot of procrastinators get caught with this. I said, shouldn't I be more mature than that? Do I nearly <laughs> need rewards? Shouldn't I be more disciplined? And they, to a person, they said, don't be stupid. Absolutely rewards work. And yeah. it's a powerful notion. I resisted initially, but I know that they work. And the research shows that also rewards work. But I, had, one of my buddies, he wrote his dissertation. His was seven chapters. Mine was six. But after every chapter he wrote, it's just like in a book. He said a book. Of, he would take a long golf weekend someplace beautiful. Yeah. And sometimes the anticipation of reward, like a birthday party or a wedding party or just a you know a regular party, it gets people yeah. more excited than the party itself. Well, he got so motivated to complete a chapter, and then he'd get on the plane, go to Florida, go to Palm Beach, go someplace nice, and treat himself to a three-day week in the golf. So he knew he had a reward waiting for him, and it just pushed him through. He finished his dissertation in a year. So rewards wow. work for your, your folks. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, you were saying like 20, like up to 25% in the United States alone. You know, are there certain personalities that are more prone to being procrastinators? Or is this something that's really natural in all of us? We all have a little bit of yep. procrastination in, yeah, inside of yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all have a little bit of procrastination in us. The chronic habit is they put off a lot of things in their lives, right? So, right. And, and what's so interesting, it's cross-cultural. You could drop me in Japan, uh, Nairobi, China, Mexico, and about 20 to 25% of the adults in those different cultures and those different uh, 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 countries uh, will be procrastinators. So it, it impacts it impacts uh, everyone, absolutely. So it's a habit that you've got to be able to learn to manage, and you can right. do that. It's not take some practice, but you can do it. Those little three things I talked about, the rewards, chewable chunks, and making your progress visible, those are powerful little strategies, simple but very powerful little strategies that will help push you uh through your procrastination have you ever found that people are in denial they don't want to admit that they're actually procrastinators yeah, and... right <laughs> right absolutely just ask your friends ask your spouse your partner or your friends and they'll tell you right away uh yes you do procrastinate and so <laughs> sometimes we, we 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 have a blind spot everyone has blind spots we don't see ourselves too well but i always yeah. say if you have a question about that ask to your colleagues at work or ask your you know wife husband spouse partner uh, what they think about you uh, are you a procrastinator and uh they'll tell you i mean it's pretty clear they'll tell you pretty pretty honestly yes you are or no you only procrastinate about a few things now you mentioned that like um one of the main things that really inspired you know you had some inspiration during lockdown to write this book what yeah. was like uh, the passion behind it the, really that the, the the flame that ignited you to say okay i'm gonna write a book because a book is very time consuming it's stressful yep. And, and it sucks the energy out of you. So, you know, it's it's what really, you know, ignited you to really want to write a book about it. Yeah, it's a great question because you writing a book is hard. You know, it's not an easy task. And I've done yeah. 12 of those. And each one has been its own challenge. 
but yeah. most of it have been kind of what I would call professional, like uh, how do you manage strategic planning or presidential transitions? And yeah, they're good books. They're very good books. This is the one book, I just finished a book on creativity and it's a fun book, you know, but this is the one I said to myself, I've wrestled with this and I've had a lot of clients, very accomplished presidents of universities, people who are very, very well off financially and they right. always wrestle with procrastination. And so I said, well, let me let me see what I have in the research and then let me talk to I talked to a lot of people over 100 leaders and yeah. realized a lot of people wrestle with it. And so I said, well, I think I can help some people manage yeah. it because the guilt and the anxiety and the stress that they feel, it, it, they pay a price for it. They really pay a price for it. They can destroy re uh, marriages and relationships. I mean, I've oh, had yeah. some friends that have been engaged for 14 years. I mean, who are you kidding? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> come on, please. <laughs> After a year or two, you should know something, right? So, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's something that, that, that plagues a, a lot of people in small ways, in small parts of their lives. But there's people who have chronic procrastination, about 20 to 25 percent. Yeah. And that's tens of millions of people. Yeah, and that's a, a lot of people. I don't think people realize that the large amount. When you think about, you know, our nation and our population and you take that percentage, that's a huge chunk yeah. of people. 50, 60 million people who you know, wake up in the morning and have a hard time because they put something off. I mean, that's a, it's a mean habit. Can I explain kind of like what it is? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, usually what happens is there's a task you don't want to do. Now, it could be overwhelming. It could be complicated. Like for me, the income tax just gets overwhelming. Right. And you get stressful. You get dread. And what happens this is the power. It's a habit. What happens is if you step away from the task, Oh, right away, you feel better. Within a second, oh, I feel better. Now, intellectually, you understand, I still got to do my income taxes. But when I leave that desk and say, I I'm done, right. I just, the emotional relief is powerful. And that is the hook. And that's a yes. powerful, powerful hook. The minute you leave, you feel better. And it just keeps on going. So you got to stop it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and where do you, you know, how do you stop it? You know, like, because you know what, when you do have that bad habit, you gave us some tools, you know, to, to help us along the way. But when, when you have a bad habit that you've done for years and years and years and years, and maybe almost your whole entire life, you know, you carry this characteristic, you know, what is the starting point The you know, step one, you know, to, because people, when they, when they see, they have to break a bad habit, you know, and they, and they, right. they see what's involved, they get overwhelmed. Just, you just, absolutely. You know, you know, so, you know, what are the little stepping stones that you find are effective for breaking a bad habit like that? Yeah, well, you, you said it uh, really on target, uh, Stacey. Starting is the hardest part for procrastinators. Yeah. So somehow you have to make starting easier. Right. And so an example might be I try to walk 10,000 steps a day because I want to, you know, I'm physically active. I can't yeah. run anymore because I'm older and my hips are gone, but I can walk forever. Yeah. And, uh, so when I started that habit of, of walking, that's a positive habit. Right. Uh, the first day it was kind of cold outside. So I'm saying, I'm looking for my, my, my shoes and do I wear a hat that could it rain? And maybe I needed to, and I spent about three or four minutes kind of confused and looking for stuff. And I finally sat down and had a cup of coffee. <laughs> I to, yeah. I, I talked to a buddy of mine. And I said, God, it was frustrating as hell. And he says, well, you got to make it a routine, Pat. Well, what do you mean by that? He said, put your shoes, and the socks and the clothes in one part of your uh, house. And when you get up in the morning, whatever you do, then you walk to that section, everything's there. And within a minute, you're dressed and you're out the door. And it is exactly true. So a routine of some kind like that can really help. Hemingway had a routine. Now he's a great writer, a couple of Nobel prizes. He would write standing up and he would write for five hours or complete five pages. That was his routine. And so there's a lot of, like Stephen King, same thing. He sits down every morning at 8.30, has a cup of tea, he has a pen and a pencil, paper, and he begins to write. And he tries to write for six hours with some breaks in between. So if right. you can build a routine of some kind, I think that's going to be really helpful. And the other thing is some people, if they build a ritual, like sometimes mm -hmm. playing your favorite music can put yeah. people in a state where whew, I can't wait to get going. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So mm -hmm. a little bit of routine. I have a friend of mine who uh, uh, burns sage, you know, has a very un unique and, and and the minute it does it, she just gets into a, a place, you know, a routine, gets into a place and she's ready to work for hours and hours and hours. So some kind of ritual or routine can be very helpful. 
I like that. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. One other yeah. thing. Can I add one other thing? There's something oh, called I temptation bundling. It's a mm -hmm. powerful notion. I didn't hear about it till about seven or eight years ago. And temptation bundling, the minute you hear yourself, of course, it's when you marry something not a negative that you don't want to do, like clean the garage or go, you know, go running with something positive. So if you have to clean out the garage, you play the sports session or you play music or you play the baseball game and listen to it while you're cleaning out the garage. That'll get oh. you through that. Uh, you know, you walk with a friend or run with a friend. You see these running clubs all over the place. There's a reason for that. It gets people motivated to do some difficult kinds of things. So that's something that's really helped temptation bundling. If you've got to do the laundry, no one wants to do the laundry. You can play music or watch TV or watch a movie while you're doing it. So if you can marry something nice with something not so nice, it'll move you forward. And Does that's that so true. Oh, yeah, because many times I've done things that I don't really want to do, and I'll put music on, and I'll put the music that I like on. And it will, it will kind of, it will take that, that mode of, oh, I really don't want to do this. And then I'm focusing on the music that relaxes yeah. me and, you know, or peps me up and I'm in a totally different zone. I'm getting this stuff done, but I'm focusing in my brain yeah. on that music and it's yep. getting me. Through. So I'm accomplishing two things. And at the end, I'm not as stressed out, you know, as I, I yeah. No, that's great. That's great that you do that. And that's what happens. If you have something positive, kind of married to it, as it were, bundled to it, it makes it a little bit easier. And that's the thing is kind of get through that initial, oh, I don't want to do this. And yeah. we do know that when you start something, about 50% of the time, people will continue. I'm not saying right. they're going to finish it, but they will continue. Well, 50% of the time is a pretty good, that's a, that's a pretty good average. So just knowing that you can start something, you'll continue. After 10 minutes, people say, hmm, that wasn't too bad. Let me do another 10 minutes. So Starting is really important, but naturally you figured out the temptation bundling. Playing pretty music or nice music for you can get you through a difficult task. Yeah. I was wondering as you were talking, um, when people are procrastinators, when they're chronic procrastinators, are there maybe other conditions or other issues in their in their life that they also they have that are 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 linked to that personality? Um is there I anything? I didn't find any in the, in the research. Now, there's some people who are clinically depressed. I mean, people who have a hard time getting out of bed. Um, yeah. This book is not going to help them. they got to deal with their deep depression. I mean, there's a lot of those kind of folks, and I, God bless them. I mean, I hope that they find help. That's where psychotherapy can work or have, working with a psychiatrist or something like that. A lot of people can't afford a psychologist, right? Yeah. I mean, at two fifty an hour for a good one. I, I mean, I, you hear that? Oh, so... But there's about 5% of the people who really need some kind of psychological support. But the rest of us can learn strategies right. and tools to, to kind of manage it. And that's why I say I can manage it. I don't cure it. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm a doctor, but I'm not a psychiatrist. So you can manage right. it. And these, these little tools and techniques are very helpful. They sound very helpful. I, I like the idea, especially when you talked about going for a walk and you have everything in, you know, organized already. And, and then it's just like, boom, 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 boom. You know, and I do that all the time. I create everything in templates. I create everything in, yep. in bundles. So it's just like, when I do things, everything's prepared for me and I put everything back where it belongs afterwards. Yep. And, but, and the next yeah. time I do it, I, you know, so it's not as stressful because you don't have to think so much. You don't have to stress yes. too much. It's already pre-done for you. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's, those are some great strategies. You had to be so productive. I mean, absolutely. You have a national audience, so you've got to be, some things have to be put in place. And like you said, you got to go back and make sure it's, it's okay. You don't just first day you have your clothes in the right spot and you move and do yeah. your 10 and then you come home and you throw your shoes over here. So you have to have discipline on both ends, but it can really be helpful. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now, when, you know, are there other, other tools and techniques for different yes. situations? I would love to absolutely. hear um, this is this is a little bit of a story. Uh, Mark Twain, he was a very famous writer. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he told us a, a great quote. He said, "Hey, if you have two tr uh, frogs to eat, eat the big one first. <laughs> and it sounds, oh, okay. Procrastinators will never eat the big one first. Ain't going to happen. Other people might do it, but procrastinators will not. So my right. suggestion is look at the smaller task or the smaller frog, mm -hmm. and tackle that." Do it in chewable chunks, 10 minutes of time. Make it a social activity with a friend. Reward yourself. Acknowledge your progress. And you might be able to get through that smaller task. Yeah. Now I feel successful, right? I said, well, I, I got that thing done. I didn't want to do it, but I got it done. Getting done is, is, is really important. 
Don't worry yes. about the time box because people are very bad at deadlines. So I can do that in an hour. And then three hours later, they're still struggling and then they get frustrated. So you've got to be much more realistic about that. And then yeah. I've done the small task or eaten the small frog. I can say, you know, let's take some of the things I did successfully and tackle the bigger task. Chewable chunks, make it social, reward myself. So I just think that's a it's a misdirection, I think, for a lot of procrastinators. It's OK to start with a small task. Right. Build confidence, build momentum, and then tackle the tougher thing. I think that's important too. You, and you said the magic word, build confidence. Like, hey, this is not yes. so bad. I could do this, you know. Absolutely. And you know, and the more confident they get, I think the easier it is to break that the bad habit. Absolutely. Yeah. Confidence is just a belief that you'll be successful. Yeah. You know, people say oh, you have to have a lot of confidence. If I believe I'll be successful at something, I will tackle it. But if I think, oh, geez, it's just too complicated, it's too overwhelming. I'm not going to do that. So exactly. Confidence is a, a belief that you can do it. And then you don't have to do it all by yourself. I hope that people hear that. Yeah. Don't get caught in the, the lone warrior kind of thing. If you yeah. can have people help you and then you help them. I'll give you a quick story. Would you say okay? Yeah, of course. So I got a buddy of mine about three years ago and he uh, has a three-car garage and he collects antiques and nicky knacks. And he's not like a hoarder, but close. <laughs> all three uh, uh, car spaces are completely filled up with boxes and trophies and awards. And and his wife was getting upset because the kids couldn't even put their bikes away. And she right. could never put their car. <laughs> and so he calls me up. And what he would do is he, he'd raise up the, the three doors. And right away, after he did that, he would just get overwhelmed and say, I'm not doing this and just shut the doors down. So he did yeah, that yeah. for like six months. And his wife was getting more upset. So he gives me a call and says, what do you think, Pat? I said, I, I have some advice for you. He said, yeah, anything. I said, is there somebody else in your neighborhood that has a, 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 a crappy garage? He said, the guy right across the street's got a, he's worse than I am. <laughs> and with Bill. So, okay, here's what you do next Saturday. You knock on Bill's door. You bring a six pack of beer over and you say, Bill, I'd like to offer you something. I'm going to buy you a beer and I'm going to help you clean out your garage for one hour. Would you be interested? Well, who's going to say no to that offer? Right, exactly. He said, you know, the only deal is next week you come to my house and you buy me a beer and uh, you work for an hour, just an hour, not clean out the whole garage. That would have been a, days and days. See the overwhelming piece. And right. it took them three months going back and forth. They enjoyed each other's company. They learned a lot about different beers and they <laughs> made each one of their garages doable. I mean, they weren't perfect. They didn't have all the racks in place and they alphabetized, but they yeah. could fit one car into the garage and all the bikes. That's a victory. That so if victory. you can work with somebody else, it's, it, it is really helpful to do that. I like that idea. That's great. You know, when you find someone you can bond with and it has a common denominator, the same as you, and then Absolutely. you give yourself back and forth, it, it, it really makes it easier. It makes it, you know, that support is big that, you know, it's, it's monumental. It really is. Absolutely. A it's a thing behind Weight Watchers or Alcoholics Anonymous or any of those kind of self-help groups to be yeah. a part of a group is really, really helpful. It gives you uh, spiritual support in some places, emotional support, strategies that you can do. So if you can do it with a group, I used to be a part of a writing group for my first book that I wrote, like, you know, 20 odd years ago. Yeah. And we met once a month for half a day. And some of the people in the group were kind of famous in this area. You know, if you mentioned their name, oh, yeah, we heard about him. And there was uh, eight people. Mm -hmm. And I never missed a meeting. Right. And sometimes some people miss meetings, usually around health things or something else happened. But you yeah. never came prepared to the group because you would let people down. Right. So you're going to say to them, oh, I just was too busy, ladies and gentlemen. They say, what? So that's a social pressure that is, you know, the risk is high because you don't want to disappoint them. But they also yeah. come to the table well prepared and ready to go. It was, it helped me uh, write my first book and I guess it was 98. So uh, wow. some kind of group support is really important yes i i agree totally i agree totally i think those are great great pointers you know you know you want group support you know having a, a support buddy having health you know trying to build your self-esteem you know realizing once you start getting things done hey i could do this you know it's this is yes. not so bad and that kind of ties in with the bundling also, you know, if you, if you're doing, if you're, if you're getting stressed and you're putting on music or you're, you have something in the background, like, uh, you know, your favorite sports channel and your, your team is playing that day, you know, it's, it makes it a lot easier. It takes that stress off, you know, and, and 
go ahead. You're no, no, say- absolutely. No, no, you're, you're exactly, you're exactly, I hope that people are hearing that. The stress can be overwhelming. What you want to do is reduce it. And there's ways you can reduce that so that you can move forward. And you don't have to complete the whole darn thing. If you do yeah. 10 minutes, that's a lot better than nothing. Another yes. 10 minutes, all of a sudden you're moving forward and forward. So exactly right. Support, confidence, reducing your stress, really important points. I think that's one of the main things a lot of people think about is think about the whole picture. And they think about yes. again, getting the whole picture done and that overwhelms them completely and throws them yeah. all the way back. Ab- absolutely. I mean, a book is a bunch of chapters, right? Yeah. Little sections. Now, it's a big task. And, it, and you, the first time I did it, that's why I went to the writer's group and said, oh, am I supposed to edit my stuff? And do I have to buy a, a, a get an editor to to fix my writing? Because my writing's very informal. I'm very prolific, but I'm informal. I'm all over the place. That's why oh, yeah. I need an editor who's going to publish. I had 55 different questions. And they said, Pat, take one chapter, write an introduction. And uh, that's all you got to do for the time being. So it's chewable chunks is really an important concept. The other thing oh, yeah. to think too, too, Stacey, is a lot of procrastinators have this myth in their head that says, I have to feel motivated. Mm-hmm. And if you're waiting around to feel motivated, you ain't going to get nothing done. I'll tell you that right now. I mean, I'm never going to feel motivated to do my income tax returns. Right. I got to do them. So I got to figure out how do I do them. But if I'm waiting for a, a good feeling about, oh, I just can't wait to do my income tax, yeah. Uh, I'll be waiting. I'll be dead. So, right. so it's really important. What we know is that movement creates energy, and energy creates motivation. Yes. So it's action, movement, and then motivation, not the other way around. People say, "I have to wait till I'm motivated. Just do something, and then see what happens." It's really important. I mean, it, it causes people a lot of pain because I'm never going to feel good about doing the invoices or my income tax, but I got to do them. Yeah. Yeah. And you had mentioned earlier in the conversation about writing things 